أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am honored, honored to be at your service during these sessions, inshallah, in which we will be studying Islamic jurisprudence. Before we start, inshallah, I'd like to um, just clarify a couple of points. Point number one. Um, feel free to uh, interrupt uh, by raising your hand or any other means just so that you know you can ask the question uh, request clarification so that um, we uh, attain the purpose of these classes which is to understand Islamic jurisprudence better and to have a good idea uh, of what is studied in Islamic jurisprudence as the case in every um, course we uh, you know have to introduce it uh, by defining it, you know, what we will be studying in it so that we uh, know what we are expecting uh, from this course. Uh, it is important, my dear, is that uh, if we wanted to make the best, inshallah, out of this course or to benefit from it, well, it's important that we write some of the notes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any slides uh, currently for the, the first several lessons of the course, but um, I guess if you have any um, um, you know, questions towards the end, inshallah, we'll dedicate the last 10 minutes uh, for that. But uh, in the meantime, if you can try to note um, at least some of the uh, things that we will be uh, discussing or uh, speaking about so that you can uh, relate or refer to them, inshallah, towards the end or after the class. And if you have any questions about them or further clarification, I would be more than happy, inshallah, to address them. So we will start, inshallah, by defining the uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Islamic jurisprudence basically is the study of Islamic rulings that are derived from the Holy Quran, the honorable Sunnah, the honorable Sunnah, which is the uh, way of the 14 infallibles, which we'll clarify, inshallah, and reason. And I'll explain what we mean by reason as well. So there are two things in this definition. Number one, there are three um, aspects uh, that we need to clarify about Islam. And then there are three sources that uh, Islam is derived from or that um, compose or constitute the sources of knowledge in Islam. Number one, the three aspects of Islam. Islam is composed uh, of three major aspects, and that is beliefs, uh, moral values, and practical rulings. In this course, inshallah, we will be uh, studying the practical rulings. We're not going to be studying the uh, Islamic beliefs. These are things that we will be studying in a different course. Inshallah, every Thursday, we have a session, just like this time, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time where we will be studying the Islamic beliefs, also known as Usuluddin, the fundamentals of faith. In this class, we will not be studying Usuluddin, we will not be studying the Islamic moral system, rather we'll focus on the Islamic rulings. So the subject of Islamic jurisprudence is Islamic rulings, or the practical rulings of Islam. The three major sources in Islam, which the Islamic rulings as well as the Islamic uh, morals as well as the Islamic beliefs are uh, derived from are the Holy Quran, the Honorable Sunnah, and reason. Of course, the Holy Quran is obvious. It is the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which was revealed upon uh, our Prophet or to our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings be upon him and his purified progeny. And by sunnah, we mean the way of the 14 infallibles. And the 14 infallibles are, of course, the Holy Prophet, his daughter, Lady Fatima al Zahra, peace and blessings be upon her, and the 12 Imams, beginning with the commander of the faithful, Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him, and ending with the 12 
awaited Savior, Al Hajjat ibn Al Hassan al Mahdi, may Allah hasten his glorious reappearance. What do we mean by Sunnah? Sunnah is the way or the way of life. It is basically the special way of life here. And it is the sayings, actions, and endorsements of the 14 infallibles. So whatever the infallibles, one of them, all of them, or any of them, says something, it is proof upon us. It resembles Islam. It represents the religion of Islam. Whatever the infallibles do also represents and resembles the religion of Islam. And whatever the infallibles endorse or approve, meaning that something is done in front of them, uh, whether it is uh, a new phenomenon that they accept without commenting on, whether it is um, somebody's action that they saw uh, and that they were able to denounce if it was wrong, yet they did not denounce, therefore that indicates that this action is correct and it is something that is, for example, permissible in Islam. So the Sunnah, in brief, is the sayings, actions, and endorsements of the 14 infallibles. And it is a major source in Islam. So we have the Holy Quran, we have the Sunnah, and we have reason. And by reason, we mean the rational facts. In our minds, or by our minds, or through our minds, we're able to uh, comprehend different things. Some of the things that we comprehend are basic, are inherent meaning that um, there are things that everyone agrees upon. There are things that are um, built within our uh, you know, mind or intellectual system. For example, the law of casualty, cause and effect. We know for every effect, there's a cause. That's not something that is acquired or learned. That is something inherent in our minds. These are facts that are undisputable, uh, you know, that are uh, there's no argument uh, about unless someone, of course, has the misconception or uh, shubha or uh, is uh, basically uh, misled by some fallacies. Otherwise, it is a very clear uh, rational fact, for example, the law of casualty. For every effect, there is a cause and so on and so forth. Or one is half of two. These are inherent rational facts as opposed to opinions or as opposed to things that are uh, that require uh, different uh, levels of reasoning. And this is usually studied in logic and in philosophy and also in theology. What we're talking about here are the um, sources of Islam, the Holy Quran, the Sunnah of the infallibles, and the facts of reason, the rational facts. For example, half one B and half of two, as we've mentioned, or for every effect there is a cause, and so on and so forth. What we study in jurisprudence based on these three sources, the Holy Quran, the Sunnah, and reason, are the Islamic rulings, the rulings of Islam. Now, to understand the definition of a ruling, or to better understand the rulings of Islam, we have to uh, understand our uh, four relationships. We have four major relationships in this life. A relationship with God, a relationship with ourselves, a relationship with other people around us, and a relationship with the environment, including you know the animals, the natural resources, and everything other than uh, human beings that surround us. When it comes to a religious ruling, a religious ruling, if we wanted to define it in a very clear in, in a very concise definition, we can say that it is the legislation of God, or we can say it is the divine legislation that organizes and regulates a human being's relationships. So how many relationships do we have as human beings? We have four major relationships. And the religious ruling is a legislation. It's a divine legislation, not any legislation, the legislation that is uh, attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a divine legislation that organizes and regulates the four relationships for human beings or of human beings. What are these four relationships? Number one, 
our relationship with the self, with our self. Each person has a relationship with their self. Each person has a duty um, towards themselves. Uh, for example, uh, how do I deal with myself? What is my responsibility towards myself? What are my limits with myself? For example, uh, do I have full authority to hurt myself? Do I have authority on how I use my body and how I use my limbs? This is with respect to the relationship with the self. And we need divine legislation to regulate that relationship and tell us what we are permitted to do with ourselves and what we are not permitted to do with ourselves. The second type of relationship or the second major relationship is our relationship with God. What is the nature of that relationship? Is it friendship? Or is it the relationship between a servant, an absolute servant with an absolute master? What is the nature of that relationship? What are our duties towards God and this relationship? You know, what are we supposed to do towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Obedience. What is the meaning of obedience? What constitutes obedience to Allah? What are the limits of obedience? How do we um, execute this obedience in our lives? Then we go on to the third major relationship, and that is the relationship with other human beings. You know, how do we deal with other human beings? How do we interact with other human beings? How do we form different relationships? For example, what are our limits with the opposite gender? How do we uh, regulate a relationship between a man and a woman? And so on and so forth. All these are uh, examples uh, of uh, Islamic rulings. Islamic Coolings are basically what organizes and regulates our relationships, whether it is with the self, whether it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or whether it is with other people. And of course, the fourth uh, major relationship, uh, which is uh, the relationship with the environment. I mean, can we make any um, type of use uh, of this environment? Do we have full access or full authority on what is around us? Can we use water? Um, and can we use the natural resources and can we deal with animals the way we like without any limits, without any regulations, or, are, or there are regulations that govern the relationship between us and the environment. For example, if we wanted to eat an animal, can we just pick out any animal and, and kill it in any way and eat it? Or there are specific regulations um, that we must follow with respect to which animal we are permitted to eat, which animal we are not permitted to eat, and how do we make it permissible, and how do we acquire it, and so on and so forth. So there are four major relationships in life that we have, one with ourself, one with our Lord, one with people around us, other human beings, and one with the environment, including animals, plants, and the rest of the natural resources, and so on and so forth. And Islam has a system that regulates and organizes this relationship or these four relationships, our relationship with these four major things. So until now, inshallah, it is clear that the Islamic ruling, which is the subject or the main subject of jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic ruling or the Islamic ruling is basically a divine legislation that organizes human lives. It's a divine legislation that organizes human lives. What do we mean by divine legislation? It's a legislation that is ascribed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a, hum a human legislation. For example, it's not a, a law that is uh, set uh, by a human constitution. Rather, it's a divine constitution. And that is very important and very special because a divine constitution or a divine legislation is free from error because it's attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as opposed to a human legislation, legislation that is done by human beings as subject to error. And of course, when we are between a legislation that is subject to error and a legislation that is not subject to error, of course, um, reason here tells us that there is um, no option but to resort to the legislation that is free of error to ensure that our life uh, is governed by uh, by a correct uh, type of uh, legislation or correct uh, legal system. 
So here, when we say divine legislation, we mean the rulings, the laws, the regulations that come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we uh, derive from the three sources that we've mentioned, the Holy Quran, the Honorable Sunnah, and of course, reason. And by reason, we said the rational facts. This is the first portion of the definition, divine legislations. The second portion or the second part of the definition is to organize and regulate human lives. And we said that by this we mean the four relationships, how a person deals with themselves, with their Lord, with their um, you know, other human beings that they live with and with the environment. After this, we will divide or um, um, mention the two divisions of Islamic rulings. Now, as you see, these are all preliminaries to the science or the study of jurisprudence. Until um, this moment, we have not discussed, for example, the rulings of Salah or the rulings of Siyam or the rulings of uh, marriage and divorce and so on and so forth. These will come. The focus right now is to understand what we mean by jurisprudence. What is studied in the science or in the study of jurisprudence? And we said that our focus here is to understand what is the ruling. This is the first preliminary in studying jurisprudence, to understand the concept of an Islamic ruling. What is an Islamic ruling? And we said that the Islamic ruling is a legislation that organizes the lives of human beings. Now, this religious ruling, the Islamic ruling, is of two types. It's divided into two types. Type number one is the action ruling, the ruling that regulates a person's action. And the second type of ruling is the ruling that sets or regulates a condition. Let's call the first one an action ruling, and the second one, let's call it a condition ruling. And I'll explain those two, inshallah, so that we can differentiate between an action ruling and a condition ruling. An action ruling deals directly with our actions, and the action rulings are only five. There are five action rulings with respect to our actions directly either our action is a must meaning that uh, it is obligatory that we do this action or it is forbidden that we do or perform this action or it is recommended also known as mustahab or it is makruh detestable or it is permissible so we have five um, action rulings, either it's obligatory, any action that we look at in our life, anything that we intend to do falls under one of these five action rulings. It is either obligatory, for example, performing salah, it's obligatory. For example, replying to one's salam, when someone says assalamu alaikum, them saying assalamu alaikum is not wajib, it is recommended as mustahab, but us with respect to replying, it is wajib on upon, upon us to reply. So initiating salam is mustahab. Replying to salam is wajib. Then we have forbidden. Forbidden, for example, um, any act that sharia, that Islam in the Holy Quran or uh, through the honorable sunnah or by virtue of reason, we know is uh, not permissible. For example, lying uh, is haram. For example, backbiting is haram. For example, hurting other people or uh, making use or uh, taking over or seizing their property without their permission. All these are unlawful things to do. And inshallah, we'll discuss uh, many, uh, many of the major unlawful acts in Islam. The default principle in Islam that we'll also discuss is that everything is permissible for us except what has been named as obligatory and except what has been named as forbidden. So if we wanted to compare the actions that are permissible or the actions that are forbidden compared to the actions that are permissible, we'd probably be at 
one uh, percent, if not less, of impermissible actions compared to the 99 percent, if not more, uh, for the actions that are permissible. So, which actions um, are permit uh, the permitted actions or the permissible actions are more than the impermissible? And this is a response to um, a commonly raised concern. You know, Islam limits our freedom. Islam limits us from doing different things. Islam here does not limit us. Rather, it regulates our actions. And the impermissible acts in Islam compared to the permissible are like one to hundred. You know, that one percent of our actions is considered to be impermissible as opposed to 99% that are permissible. And that will be clear as we go, inshallah, with these lessons. So again, the Islamic ruling, and these are very important to comprehend and understand, and this is why um, they are preliminaries, meaning they introduce fiqh, and fiqh is founded upon them. So to understand Islamic laws, when we come to them in detail, it is important that we understand these preliminaries. So the Islamic ruling, which regulates a human's life, which organizes the life of human beings, is divided into two major types. An action ruling, which is one of five, either obligatory, forbidden, recommended, detestable, permissible, or it is a condition ruling. What do we mean by condition ruling? Condition ruling simply means a a uh, ruling that regulates a specific condition. For instance, uh, ownership, also known as uh, proprietorship. What sets um, the uh, conditions uh, of ownership? In other words, how does someone own something? So how do I own something else? Buying, uh, gifting, um, seizing. What sets the boundaries of ownership? How does an ownership, uh, for example, take place? If I place my hand over something, does that make me the owner of it? Or I have to pay a price to someone and take it from them and that makes me the owner? This is called a condition ruling, meaning it does not relate directly to our actions. So if I said ownership, it doesn't fall under obligatory. It's not obligatory to have ownership, right? It's not forbidden. It's not recommended, it's not detestable, uh, it's not permissible in that sense, meaning uh, you know whether it is lawful or unlawful. It's just merely a condition, ownership. So what does this have to do with Islamic ruling? We said Islamic ruling governs or organizes and regulates a human life. And part of human life is the concept of ownership. So how does someone own something? Once we have determined the regulations of ownership, then automatically that will take us to the action rulings. For example, if we determine that by, you know, by a person putting their hand on something, something that is not owned by anybody, and someone comes in, seizes it, it becomes theirs. If this makes up ownership, this entails that no one is permitted to take away this possession from its rightful owner. But if this person is not an owner, meaning that them laying their hand on that thing does not make them an owner, then it is permissible for us to take that. Thing. You see how a condition ruling sets the ground for an action ruling. They work hand in hand. Marriage, on the other hand, or uh, let's call it the matrimonial relationship, marriage. When somebody, when a woman and a man conduct a marriage contract, this is a condition ruling. It's not an action ruling. It's a condition ruling. Marriage in itself is a condition. But this condition entails action rulings. It entails on the man, on the husband, to support their wife to be kind to their wife, to give their wife her rights. And it entails ruling upon the wife to give her husband's uh, rights, to act in accordance with what is obligatory upon her towards her husband, and so on and so forth. Likewise, for instance, validity or invalidity. When we say something is valid, this transaction is valid, and this transaction is invalid. If I said, for instance, 
um, you know, Islam, of course, said that selling this type of commodity is invalid. If it's invalid, this is a condition ruling. It entails an action ruling, which is we are not permitted to take that commodity or, you know, for the, for the person who sold the commodity, they are not permitted to take the money from the other person and the other person is not permitted to take that commodity. Why? Because that transaction is invalid. Of course, we're talking with respect to sale or selling the transaction, not with respect to um, taking it as a gift or uh, the seller can choose to say, you know what, even though this transaction is invalid, here you can, you can take the commodity and it's no longer considered a sale, rather it's considered a gift. So we have different concepts in Islam. A gift is a concept or um, a condition and selling and buying is a different condition. So Islam not only regulates Islamic jurisprudence or Islamic rulings, not only regulate our actions, but they also regulate the conditions that our actions stand upon or depend upon. So in brief, in summary, an Islamic ruling is a legislation, a divine legislation that regulates the lives of human beings. And it is divided into two major types, a condition ruling that sets a condition, regulates a condition like proprietorship, like marriage, like validity and validity, purity and purity. So you get this a lot, for example, you know, someone says, you know, uh, is it uh, halal, for example, is urine halal or haram, right? We say that's, that's incorrect to ask it this way. We say, is urine uh, pure or impure? So urine is impure. Now, is impure, uh, does this have to do with it being obligatory, recommended, of course? No, it has nothing to do with that. Impurity or purity only um, regulates or sets a condition for us. It tells us that whenever there is urine, we need to treat it as impure. However, um, this entails an action ruling, which is the uh, unlawfulness of consuming anything that has come into contact with urine, let alone urine itself, so on and so forth. I, I hope, inshallah, I was able to uh, clearly um, uh, explain uh, these preliminaries to you. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if there is something that is ambiguous, something that is uh, unclear, uh, please do not hesitate to, uh, you know, to ask throughout the lesson. Uh, I am still uh, not very uh, you know, uh, used to Zoom, so therefore I'm not sure if you have something that uh, you want to add or that you want to ask before we continue, um, I only see my screen. Uh, I don't know if the others um, have access to maybe perhaps uh, sending a message or raising their hand if they uh, choose to ask a question or uh, during this, if they have something that they find unclear that they want to um, you know, address or ask, please do not um, hesitate. Um, I don't like this to be a very formal session, uh, you know, rather than uh, that it should be uh, somewhat informal, meaning we can you know, stop, um, have a discussion on something, have a question and answer since we have uh, 50 minutes to an hour in this session. So if any of you have a question or a clarification or an addition, please do not hesitate to uh, stop me and ask. So up until right now, we have um, understood that Islamic jurisprudence studies the Islamic rulings, and, and the Islamic rulings are uh, of two major types. They are the condition rulings and the uh, action rulings. And action rulings are only five, one out of five. Either they are the obligatory actions, the forbidden actions, the recommended actions, the detestable actions, and the permissible actions. And we said that permissible takes the majority. In other words, everything is permissible except the four, the obligatory, the forbidden, the recommended, and the abhorred. And of course, the recommended and the abhorred, we are not responsible to observe them. We are um, rewarded for observing them, but they are not incumbent or they're not obligatory uh, and binding for us. In other words, if I choose to only do that which is obligatory and refrain from that which is forbidden, um, that's all that is uh, required. That is, of course, the minimum. But if I wanted to elevate with 
the relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and become a, a better servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and enhance my relationship with the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, then I should strive to stay away from that which is detestable and strive to perform and do the things that are recommended, of course, as much as possible. Um, we are not uh, recommended to, uh, you know, to do every single act that is recommended where it becomes a burden upon us or where we become uh, very um, you know, burdened by so much recommended acts that we have to do. This is why when it comes to the recommended act, it's good that you choose that which is uh, near and dear to your heart. So, for instance, during the nights of the month of Ramadan, during the nights of Qadr, when we see that there are, there's a long list of recommended a'mal, recommended acts, um, and we say, you know what, this is so much, um, I'm going to try to do all of them, um, then we don't feel the, the, the taste of these a'mal. We don't engage with them and interact with them well simply because we are just worried about this long list and trying to uh, complete that list, as opposed to the right method and the right approach, which is to take from these a'mal that which we can interact better with, that we can, uh, we can make um, you know, a better, uh, you know, uh, that we can have a better uh, fruit out of, uh, just like, for example, eating uh, different fruits or different types of food. We don't usually sit and eat every single thing we see in front of us. There are certain foods that we like. There are certain foods that we don't like. So not to say that there are certain a'mal or actions that are mustahab. Not that we don't like them, but it is we don't interact with them so well. So if I don't interact with a specific amal so well, then why not go to the other amal or the other recommended act that I interact with very well, since they are not obligatory upon me, rather they are recommended. To that which is forbidden, we must avoid. We have no option. And as opposed to that which is obligatory, which we must do, we have no option. Ada, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. I don't want to go for too long. I think uh, what we have said is enough for today's session. If you have any questions, uh, clarifications required or concerns, please don't hesitate to raise them. Do you guys have any questions? No, thank you. All right, I guess if no one has any questions, if you want to add any more things, Maulana, Sayedna, we can end the session, I guess. Uh, there's nothing further for today, inshallah, but please remember that uh, uh, in the future lectures, okay, so that's a good question, what we'll be covering in the future lectures. So we will be covering, after we have defined the Islamic ruling, we'll um, cover the two, um, uh, the two uh, types of rulings with a different aspect or with, with a different um, division. We'll talk about the primary rulings and secondary rulings. And after that, inshallah, we will talk about the um, uh, rulings of taqlid. Uh, then we will talk about the uh, rulings uh, of, uh, of course, purity, tahara, the rulings of salah, siyam, and the rest of the acts of worship in the first section or in the first, um, uh, you know, the first uh, chapters of the Islamic clause book. Um, that being said, I highly recommend uh, uh, accessing the Islamic clause book. Uh, on the uh, Sayyid Sistani's website, the, the uh, formal or the official website in Najaf, uh, sistani.org, uh, or even uh, purchasing the book Islamic Laws, which is found on imam-us.org. Um, there is a link to purchasing it. When we start talking about different Islamic rulings, beginning with taqlid and then purity and so on and so forth, um, we will be referring to that book, Komesh and Nasail, in that book. What is unique about this class is that we're not going to discuss these masail in detail as in, you know, this issue number one says this, issue number two says this. Rather, we're trying to build um, a structure 
you know, that we, we, we're trying to clarify the structure of fiqh. In other words, the, um, the, the outline of fiqh and the different things that are studied in fiqh, and then we leave the details for a person's uh, own uh, reference. You know, you refer to the Book of Islamic Laws, but by using and implementing what we will um, instruct for or teach in this class, you're able to refer to the Book of Islamic Laws and understand the Nisa'il uh, better, inshallah. The next session will be with the Sayyid on the Islamic belief on Thursday, the same time at 11. You can access it on the same link. And uh, the same link for Islamic jurisprudence as well on Tuesday next yeah. Tuesday. So, inshallah, that's it. Inshallah. Yes, inshallah. So, every Tuesday, inshallah, we will be uh, studying Islamic jurisprudence, in other words, Islamic laws. And every Thursday, we'll be um, studying the Islamic beliefs. Uh, inshallah, I, I thank you all very much, and I appreciate uh, your your um, uh, listening. Inshallah, I hope you all benefited. Yes, there is a recording. Uh, I believe uh, our dear Sayyid Jihad will upload the uh, recorded video to uh, YouTube a, a later time. Inshallah, uh, where you can uh, refer to it. Inshallah. Majur, inshallah. Ma'jurin antum kadalik, all of you, inshallah. May Allah bless all of you and give you the best of tawfiq, inshallah. Ajarakum Allah. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah bless you all. Jazakum Allah. Thank you, Sayyidina. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.